Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tim Sharks. I'm a professor of geography at Green River College, and this is a video lecture presentation series on human geography to accompany Geography 200, Human Geography at Green River College. I am making this series of videos based on the textbook Human Geography by David Dorrell, Joseph Henderson, Todd Lindley, and Georgetta Connor. This is the second edition that I'm going through. The textbook is available as a free public domain textbook. I should caution you that while I am following the textbook for this series of lectures, there are some changes I'm making to the content. I'm supplementing it with my own examples. I am also going a little bit above and beyond in some places from the textbook where I don't feel like the textbook has done as thorough of a job as it might or as I might like to see, which is fine. Everyone has their own preferences in approaching these topics like geography. And um, I may omit sections of the textbook in these lectures as well, and I might actually add to the material and bring in my own, um, my own view of, of what I think the better way to teach something is, a concept or, a, or an idea or an example. So let's get into it. This is our first chapter, and I'm going to get about halfway through the chapter in this presentation. So the chapter outline here is organized into a few really brief themes. Uh, section 1.1 is so short, they don't even bother putting it in the outline here, or I didn't anyway. And then we're going to get down here to how do I describe where I am. And then I'll save the last three themes, which are a little bit more complicated and uh, I want to spend a little more time on for a separate lecture. Let's get into the very introduction then of what geography is. I suspect that these, uh, the resolution on these uh, individual little circles are uh, a little bit small for your reading here, but I'll get to them in a minute. Um, geography, short, in, in, in very brief, is a writing about the earth or telling a story about the earth, so that's the, the Latin root of the word geography. We can divide geography into both human geography and physical geography. This course focuses mostly on the human dimension or cultural dimension of geography. There is a whole separate field of geography on physical processes that has a lot in common with, with what people think of as geology. Uh, and so those two words get confused. Geology and ge geography get used interchangeably sometimes, but they are distinct. Uh, physical geography overlaps with a lot of geology at the surface of the earth. So processes around landform change and formation uh, have to do a lot with physical geography, but also with geology. So there's some overlap there. But as I mentioned, we're going to spend most of our time talking about human dimensions of geography. Of course, we can't ignore the physical environment because people do live in physical places in real environments. So that comes in throughout the quarter as we go through this textbook. And then when we talk about the dimensions of geography as a science, since we're writing about the Earth, there's a lot of overlaps between geography and a bunch of other disciplines. So here we have psychology as a discipline having to do with uh, how the brain works and how uh, people perceive their environments. And then we have within geography the field of behavioral geography. Or here we have history and then historical geography. Or, as I already mentioned, geology is a separate discipline, but then geomorphology is a physical geography uh, discipline. So geography, you can think about this a bunch of different ways. You can think about it as geography being a subject that borrows from a lot of disciplines, which is, I think, a fair thing to say about it, but makes it sound like it's maybe stealing from those disciplines, right? Or another way to think about this is geography is a discipline that unifies a lot of different disciplines, pulls them all together into one way of thinking about the world. That is what we call the spatial perspective. The spatial perspective is a way of looking at the world, a way of looking at humans and human society, and thinking about where people are, what they do, and making sense of it. And ideally, when we get into science, we try, try and not just make sense of it, but, but 
build theories that help us predict uh, different occurrences or different patterns. So the way our book puts it is a little bit cruder than this. The, the book has a, a shorthand about what geographers ask, and I think it's confusing. So I actually went for a little bit longer version of the same, which is geography asks the question, or the questions, I guess. There's really two questions here. Where are things located, and why are they there? Implicit in that question sometimes is, how did they get there? By what processes did they form? And by what processes were they moved, right? But those are all subordinate to this, where are things? Which is fundamental to geography. When I talk about geography, people automatically assume they're talking about where things are. Like, what's the capital of? Or what is the largest country in? That kind of question is about where things are, right? And why are they there? That's an important question that we ask in geography, and that's bringing all these disciplines into bear. So different questions we have, different specialties we might look at to answer those questions, but they're all about why things are where they are in space. And I don't mean outer space, I mean like physical space, the, the, the distance between things or the proximity or clustering of things, their relationship to one another. So moving on, our textbook has a requisite section on map projections, and it points out this, uh, this Mercator projection is a great example of a commonly used map projection. So we're taking a round Earth and we're trying to flatten it into a, uh, into a flat plane on a piece of paper or a screen like this, and distortion is automatic. You can't take a spherical object like the Earth and make it into a flat thing without changing something about it. You've either got to change the direction or the relative distance or the shape or um, the scale of some parts of the map compared to the other. And so you're making a compromise with a projection of something as large as the Earth anytime you make a projection. The Mercator projection here that you see, which is quite popular, uh, is popular because it maintains north and south everywhere on the map. So north is always directly to the top, south is always directly to the bottom, and then of course east and west are side to side here. Um, the challenge to that though is it distorts the areas near the North Pole and South Pole. We don't notice it as much in the Southern Hemisphere because Antarctica is not included in this map right here, and the um, southern land masses do not extend as far south of the equator as the northern land masses do north of the equator. Let me show you what I mean. And this is one of the advantages of computer technology. We have now tools like Google Earth that give us a computer-based mapping tool that avoids having to use a projection. And this is pretty cool to think about, which is uh, you can look at the Earth in this kind of a sphere. And I'm sorry, I can't get this centered on the screen any more than this. Maybe if I... I think it's just the way Google Earth runs, but you get the idea. So we have a spherical Earth here, and, and we can rotate the view virtually in a way that it works like a globe on a two-dimensional screen, which is pretty cool. And that avoids this problem of having Greenland appear to be as big as North America. We can look at Google Earth on the, the spherical simulated view here and see that Greenland, in fact, is not nearly as large as it appears in a Mercator projection. We get an instant idea of how distorted the view of northern land masses is because of that Mercator projection. I'm sorry, I have a, I, I switched the wrong tab here. There we go. This Mercator projection really stretches out these northern areas and makes them seem disproportionately large. One line of uh, thought in critical geography, uh, or one, one criticism of this projection in particular, is that by distorting northern land masses, it's actually made them appear more important on this kind of map. And so, for example, we see here that Africa and South America look relatively small compared to North America, and Europe is still appearing smaller than Africa here, but it is much larger than it should appear, especially northern Europe, if we look at the actual scale of Europe compared to Africa. So take a look at this distance here, and you get a really a real idea about how small all of Europe is when we compare it to 
the landmass of all of Africa, right? And so this, this relative distortion, this distortion, and the, the map maker was making this map with the goal of maintaining north and south, right? But the accidental or um, um, un, unintended consequence was to make northern land masses appear larger and therefore because they're larger, they appear more important in terms of what your eye sees, at least, right? Whereas it, compared to those northern land masses, it, it shrinks these areas closer to the equator down here and makes them appear less important. So that's a really quick overview of projection. Our next topic within maps is map scale. And this is backwards from what a lot of people think about in terms of large things and small things. Uh, so map scale is the is a term for the relationship between units on the map to units on the ground. And a large scale map means that the, the, the relationship between the units on the map and the units to the ground is closer. And then a small scale map means you've shrunk that units on the map to be worth even less than a unit on the ground, much less. So a small scale map is shrunk more, if you want to think about it that way. Again, digital mapping gets us this ability to really see things in a little bit different way because the scale is highly variable. You can zoom way in on things. I'm going to, sorry, I was just over this, but I'm going to zoom in here on Green River College at a very large scale. And so here's a large scale map of Green River College. By the way, I usually try to avoid confusion about large and small scale because people hear large and they think about big things like a country or a continent, but large scale mapping means very close in, right? Um, and so I try to avoid the confusion by just talking about things at a local scale or a regional scale or a global scale. And that gives you an idea about how big or small of the thing we're talking about, not the map scale. But anyway. This is a very large scale map here. We've got to zoom in on Green River's campus and we see that you can see individual classrooms highlighted. You can see the buildings. There's pathways highlighted. A few different observations to be made about this map. And this is useful to think about as cart about cartography as a discipline and, and map making as a way of creating a tool for people to use. Uh, what we have here is not actually what's on the ground, this is an abstraction of what's on the ground. Because if I were to actually be a bird flying above this space, I would see this. And so the abstraction is useful because it tells us the names of the buildings. And we still have the names of the buildings here as well. So that's added to this map and they don't actually appear there on the ground. Um, we get more information here in the satellite view or the bird view, if you want to call it that. But we get less information in other ways or less clear information where the map maker in this case has decided to highlight the pathways between places and missed some of them, but that's okay. Um, and then also highlighted what's within each building. Now, how you get to different levels within the building, I'm not sure about because there's multiple floors in a lot of these buildings, but at least it tells us a little bit more about even what's inside the building, which is, is pretty cool that they have this level of resolution. So. Um, that's, that's all out there. Now, as we zoom out, we still see again that there's an abstraction. We have bodies of water highlighted. We have major roads highlighted, but we don't have individual houses highlighted, right? So the abstraction tells us the information that we think is the most useful. In this case, Google Maps is used mostly for navigation. And so the most important thing to highlight there, the feature to highlight there is important place names like destinations for traffic to go to a golf club or the raceways here, for example, right? Or maybe shops, right? Different, different retail establishments, um, town names, and then the streets connecting them all. So that's what we see highlighted here in this example. As we zoom out, we cover an even larger area, but we start getting less and less information. So it's not that one scale is good or bad, it's that different scales provide different levels of information. So what I would, what I would use a large scale map for, for like walking my way around campus, isn't useful for a different activity like driving from Auburn to Tacoma, for example. 
And so that's, that's a, di a different scale map is used for a different purpose because it contains a different level of information. And then if I were to ask a question like, why are Seattle and Tacoma important port cities? The fact that they're on the ocean is relevant, but then also looking at their position relative to global trade. And this is not a good view way to look at it, but it's okay because it's a Mercator projection. Um, it'd probably be better for me to look at that question using a spherical Earth here, like it really is, and pointing out that Seattle and Tacoma are located on the Pacific Rim with a large ocean, but still easily crossed by major freighters to East Asia, and therefore trade with East Asia to Seattle and Tacoma is possible and, in fact, is a major economic driver of the region. So that's an economic question we can ask using geographic tools, and that's part of the practice of economic geography, is asking what is the industrial base or economic base of cities? What is it about the city's location that makes them well-suited to that economic activity? How might that change in the future? These are all geographic questions to ask. All right. So we've covered map scale. Um, really quickly, our book goes into, again, this is almost something they just have to check off because it wouldn't be a geography class unless we talked about um, parallels and meridians, latitude and longitude. Uh, but one way of ask, answering the question is using a term like latitude and longitude, using terms like latitude and longitude. Uh, that kind of location is sometimes called an, an absolute location because there's only one point on Earth that has those specific coordinates. So it's absolute, it's still relative to a, an arbitrary location, in this case, the prime meridian. But we've got parallels and meridians here that indicate latitude and longitude. So longitude is your distance north of or south of the equator in, 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 uh, in degrees, with the farthest you can get away from the equator 90 degrees north or 90 degrees south. And then meridians measure your distance east or west of the prime meridian, which is in Greenwich, England. And so you move, you move either here <coughs> to the west or this way to the east. And degrees longitude maxes out at 180 degrees east or west longitude, uh, depending on which way you've gone around the Earth to get to that location. So that, that way, that line on the other side, by the way, is the international date line because we, we use the meridians to organize our time, uh, our time zones. So when you go around 12 hours, you've got to go to the previous or next day, depending on which way you're going, uh, to keep, to keep the, the, the clock right because you don't, otherwise you could just go around the, the world fairly fast and, and gain on time or lose on time. <laughs> So that's the way our, our time is sorted out through that. Moving on, the question then of not how do I say where I am using some absolute coordinates, we can talk about practicalities because nobody gives their, their location in latitude and longitude, right? Or in the case of uh, a map like Google Maps, uh, you can use latitude and longitude or you can use uh, universal transverse mercator locations, which is what GPSs are fired on, uh, what they rely on. But I could, if I said I'm on Green River College campus, I could say my location in latitude and longitude, right? I could say I'm at 47.313 degrees north, um, 122.17865 degrees west longitude. Uh, but no one would know what I was talking about, right? They'd have to plug those numbers in and find out where that was and say, oh, you mean Green River College, right? So the, the question of how do I describe where I am becomes more complicated than just latitude and longitude. And we start relying on descriptions of things like site and descriptions like situation. By the way, we also use a term called a place name or a toponym to describe where we are. And that's a shortcut. So I just gave that example of I'm at Green River College. And if you know where that college is, then that's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything more because you and I share that shortcut. We have the place name to tell us that it's the same place. When we're traveling internationally, someone might say, where are you from? And we might say Auburn. And they might say, where's that? Or we might say something like the next biggest city, like Seattle or the West Coast of the United States or Washington state. And then we can get 
all kinds of confusion. I've been traveling before where I've said I'm from Washington State because no one knew what even Seattle was. And then people say, oh, Washington, D.C. And then, you know, they'd say George Bush or Obama or Trump because that was what they associated with the United States is Washington is the capital of the United States. And I say, no, no, the other Washington. And so, so there's this problem of place names, right, which is that they can be a shortcut, but they can also be confusing. And if we don't know what the place name is a shortcut for, then we need to tell people about how the place, what the place we live is like. So we can do that a couple different ways. One way is describing the physical and sometimes human characteristics of a place. And so I could say something like, well, Green River College is a two-year school. Uh, it's not a four-year academic school. It's a two-year academic school uh, located in Auburn, Washington. It's up on a hill. You see how I'm describing the physical characteristics? It's surrounded by trees. Campus itself has a lot of greenery, including a lot of trees. So it's quite green and lush. Um, there's a lot of students on campus, not as many as before the pandemic, but certainly the most at any time during the pandemic when I'm recording this, right? Um, and the students come from all over the place. A lot of them are from the greater Auburn area, including up to Kent and some from down by Enumclaw or Puyallup, um, but all over the region and um, fairly young on average, but again, a good mix of students from all backgrounds, including age. And then we have a large international student population as well. So I'm describing everything that's going on on campus in a way that gets someone who doesn't know anything about that place a little bit of an image of what it's like. I could talk about the buildings. The buildings are um, one story to three stories tall. Uh, they're full of classrooms. There's a, there's a, um, a lunchroom cafeteria on campus. There's a coffee shop. There's a gym. Right? There's lots of parking lots on campus describing all of the, the physical characteristics of the place. Right? And then I can also talk about the location of a place relative to other places. And that's one of the ways if we're telling someone about a place they don't know about, it gives them a little bit of something to tie it onto, but it also explains a place's importance about why it's where it is. So Green River College is up on Lee Hill above downtown Auburn it's located between, uh, and Auburn itself is located between Kent to the north and, Co and Puyallup to the south. It's a little bit uh, southwest of Covington. It's east of Federal Way. Uh, the nearest college is the um, Pierce County branch campus down in, in, um, in Puyallup, and then there's one in Stillicum as well. And uh, so we, we have a picture about where the campus is and how it's in the middle of its service area, right? And that's why it's, it is where it is. That's why it's, a, that's why it's lo location is where it is. It's not just random. So we can look at this with respect to unimportant places or also very important places. I think Green River is somewhere in the, in the medium important places, right? Um, in terms of like all the situation factors, because there's many community colleges in Washington state, all of which are located to be close to the communities that they serve. Uh, when we look, for example, the, the textbook gives us a description of New Orleans where it says New Orleans has a physical characteristic of being very low lying and some of, the, some of the ground in New Orleans is actually below sea level, so extremely flood prone. That's just a physical fact of New Orleans, right? Um, but then why would you build a city on a sinking marsh? Well, the answer is in the situation, which is it's at the mouth of the largest river in North America that serves as a very important trade route and was a, a historically and to today a massively important port for the flow of goods and services both out of the interior of the U.S. to international destinations as well as the movement of materials from international destinations into the interior of the U.S. That's the nexus of it all. That's where it comes together uh, is right at New Orleans. So New Orleans as a physical site of places to put a city doesn't make much sense, but from a situation standpoint, makes great sense to, to locate a city there. I'm going to stop for now and come back in the next video with a wrap up of the second part of the chapter. It will probably be about as long of a presentation, even though there's not as much to cover because uh, there's some really important concepts to go over in that second half. Thanks so much for your attention. I hope you're enjoying learning about geography so far, 
and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.